So this is building believable characters in VR with Alchemy Labs. Uh, who am I? I'm Andrew Eike, producer, developer, and alleged certified adult TM. Uh, right. So <laughs> I was involved in a, a lot of the process on Rick and Morty. I was uh, leading the project. So we're going to go into a little bit about what's going on with characters and uh, kind of how, how we made them work. Uh, if you were at our previous talk, you, some of this will probably be review, uh, the, you know, the postmortem we did. But uh, to, you know, for those of you who don't know who Alchemy Labs is, uh, we made a game, a VR game called Job Simulator, and that was super awesome and super fun. And we also made a VR game called Rick and Morty Virtual Recality, which is what we're talking about today. And here's a quick trailer to show you what this about. Rick? Looks like some sort of crazy video game about us or something. It's not just a video game, Morty. It's a virtual reality game. I sold our likenesses to some video game publisher for a lot of money, Morty. Uh, I mean, who's gonna play this? You're gonna play this, Morty. <laughs> what? Oh my God! You, you, you killed it. I mean, me. I mean, VR for I, everyone. I, uh, everyone with the box on their face, Morty. It's raining money here in VR land. It's raining money. Ha ha! Love a dub dub. Great. So, <laughs> so that is uh, that's our 30-second trailer. Uh, as Alex and Evan said, that actually played on TV. So that's it. that really happened. So, what are our goals? What are our goals here with these characters in Rick and Morty? Uh, we wanted to make sure that the characters were fully realized. Rick and Morty are the titular characters in the IP. They are what this whole thing is about. What everybody loves. When you think about this show, you think about those characters, and we wanted you to feel like you are there with Rick. Uh, and Morty in an episode going through the whole thing. So they needed to, they need to feel real, they need to feel believable. Um, this is gonna be a very dense presentation, so <laughs> good luck to all of us. Uh, but moving on, and now you can see why it's dense. So uh, what's our pipeline for making this character, for making these characters? Through most of the project we had one animator, so we're gonna go into a lot of weird tricks we used to make it so that one animator was capable of animating over 30 minutes of animation, including the trailer. What you see there is a picture of a zoomed in view of uh, Maya timeline, and then that little zoomed in view is actually the, uh, the, the zoom out there. So that's our whole animation for just Rick. And uh, we ended up doing uh, Rick and Morty and a little bit of Summer. So let's talk about some design specific to VR and characters before we get into how we built them. A big part of VR is play spaces, and as you know, we're very focused on room scale. So how do we get these full characters and not make them feel uh, weird or like they're encroaching on you? So one of the big things we found out early on is don't cross the player's space. You don't know where the player's gonna be, so you can't just stand, you can't just have a character cut diagonally across a play space. So what we did early on is we separated the garage into three zones and left a single safe zone. And that safe zone, we knew we could do whatever we wanted with the characters. If we did want to interact with the, uh, you know, with the player, we only interact on the edges of the zone. So there's a time where you high five Rick or Rick and Morty stand right on the edge of your play space, but we don't want them crossing into there because it feels really weird. Especially if you, if you get it right with the characters, then it feels like somebody's like entering your bubble and that's incredibly uncomfortable. And you can see that safe zone is the highlighted spot on this slide. Also, the character design was important. So we were building off a 2D show. These characters had never been done in 3D before. So we had to figure out what all of that meant. Uh, what you see here is a picture of one of the tests that, uh, that our animator did early on, Ben, where he put a ton of different Ricks and Mortys in VR uh, with different textures, different lighting, different shading. You can even see an outline shaded uh, Rick in the background there, just to see what it looked like in VR before we committed to a single art style and went through the whole like rigging and animation process. So it was really important to get these characters in VR, but we wanted to go fully 3D. We realized that uh, you know, due to the canon of the universe and the way the VR works, we didn't want to just put a billboarded 2D Rick and Morty walking around. Um, we also did no outline shading. And in, in, in practice, outline shading sounds great, right? It's a cartoon, we wanna draw an outline around there. But um, what we found is outlines make incredible screenshots, uh, but in reality, there's a convergence of the eyes that happens, and since the line isn't in the exact same spot between both eyes, it actually appears to you as like a set of flashing. And it's really weird and disorienting, and so outline shading in VR just hasn't, we haven't figured out the tech such that it doesn't make the player feel really uncomfortable. 
So those are kind of the basic design constraints. So let's get into how do we make a character. So we're going to go from like uh, the start to kind of the end of like how we actually built these characters to work in VR. Um, and for some of you who are artists, this might be you know things that you already know. Hopefully, there's some really interesting new things that we did. But uh, this is just kind of a, a process of how we got this done. So uh, we began with some ZBrush sculpts. We actually went and uh, and acquired, purchased some assets from some an artist that had already sculpted Rick and Morty. And that kind of gave us like a, a kickoff point to see what they could look like in 3D. And then what you see here is a draw over that Ben, our artist, did where he, um, where he notated all over the ZBrush sculpt what the differences were. And, and, the, and the Rick turnaround you see is actually from their art Bible. So um, Rick and Morty, the show, provided us with like a 2,000 page art Bible with every single character. Uh, turnabouts and a ton of just amazing art. They were so great to work with, and it's insane that they were able to give that to us. So that's the actual Rick uh, turnabout, and so we were able to use that and this model, and then we re-sculpted it all from scratch. And so, um, you know, on the left is the original ZBrush uh, sculpt that we acquired, and on the right is our kind of redo of that. And you can see some of the notes going into, into that sculpt. We also had to do rigging. This is a standard process. So we were like, oh, yeah, we could cheat. Let's use Mixamo. They're super awesome. So we went and we like slapped a Mixamo auto rig and we started there. And then like we realized that like Rick has a coat and you know he's got one eyebrow and Morty has all these different kind of characteristics. So we ended up heavily modifying it. Uh, so just kind of my point of note there is that it was really great for prototyping, but in the end, we probably should just like kicked that rig out and just built a new rig from the ground up because we ended up ma basically making an entire new rig. So that's, that's Rick's rig right there that you're taking a look at. And you can see like the articulated fingers and uh, I think there's an eyebrow joint in there. One of the other really, really powerful things we did is we built a level of abstraction in Maya itself uh, for the animation. So. Um, our, our artist was incredibly skilled at scripting Maya in addition to actually performing the animation. And he created all these tools. So instead of manipulating the joints individually, he was actually manipulating these tools and it was using a bunch of cool math to make the, uh, the, the model move without having to um, kind of go down on that more granular, granular level. This allowed for like a, a very quick turnaround in animation. And, and these kind of abstracted tools really, really helped us uh, because it didn't, you know, we didn't have to start from scratch with these things. So you can see some of the original tools are annotated up there as, as uh, he was building them. For our facial animation, we use a standard blend shape, but instead of um, <coughs> just building a set of kind of morph targets, we actually built these custom controls to manipulate the face. And there you can see the controls working in a kind of creepy fashion to manipulate the face. But um, what we did there is built a, built a phoneme database based on that. So that's each like individual pronunciation when your mouth moves. Uh, and we'll get into like what that actually looks like. But we could use this to, to put these sliders and dials at certain positions and know like, that's the letter O, and that's the letter O when the character's smiling, and that's the letter O when the character's frowning. And again, it's, it's this level of abstraction that really helped us kick out animations much faster with a much smaller team. Pupils are a thing. They're a thing that's huge in the Rick and Morty universe, the weird star-shaped pupils that they love to use. And so we wanted to make sure we accurately represented that. Rick and Morty were easy. They had round eyes, so we just rolled it. We could point the pupil wherever we wanted, but we kind of rolled the sphere and moved around. Summer has an oblong spheroid eye. It's not a sphere, so uh, we came up with a novel system. We actually used a bone in the rig to uh, figure out where on the mesh we were going to place the pupil. So the pupil is separate geometry and it moves around. And this turned out great. Um, and we'll talk later about like pointing and looking and why that's important. And so having that pupil control was really important to us. So here we are. This is our Rick and Morty kind of character sheet. In the end, you can see um, all the different phonemes on the, you know, with the individual characters, and then some kind of some kind of interesting poses just to show it off, and then some kind of uh, you know turnabout stuff just to kind of give you a sense of what the character looked like. And this is what the character ended up looking like in the final game. We actually made very few modifications to the. Um, 
to the initial like uh, you know texturing and, and modeling that we did on these characters. So let's talk about looking and pointing. So when you're when you're having a conversation with somebody, you are uh, you are alternating. If you're having it with multiple people, you're alternating between looking at them and looking at somebody else that you're talking to, and back and forth. And we wanted the player to feel like they were part of the conversation. So. It's really, really important when characters are looking or pointing, this might get real weird, uh, when characters are looking or pointing, that they were able to uh, also include the player or include dynamic areas without us having to go through all the pain of like hoping that the player was standing there. So we built a system to allow us to dynamically point or look at the character and in fact in the animation we and I'll, we'll talk about this in a second in the animation we do some tricks to alternate between when we're looking at the player and then when we're looking at when Rick is looking at Morty or vice versa because that just makes you feel like you're part of the conversation and it doesn't matter where you are uh, Rick will follow you so we built a custom preprocessor for FBXs in Unity. So when we imported it, we ran this preprocessor. In Maya, the artist had a tool to put metadata on a keyframe that they built in MelScript. They would place the metadata, and then the preprocessor would read those meta events and create a Unity animation event. That Unity animation event would enable or disable an IK solver for either the arm for pointing or for the eyes for looking. So that would basically say like, okay, stop, you know, stop playing the animation and begin looking at some specific target which is passed in via this animation event. Whether it's the player or an item in the world or, you know, kind of any, anything like that. And here's what that ends up looking like. Uh, with him here, he's both looking and pointing at you. Uh, if you played the game, this is a, if you haven't played the game, this is a spoiler, but in the beginning of the game, Rick shoots you and it's like an incredibly powerful moment uh, where most players, when Rick points the gun at them, they start moving around and trying to duck and avoid it. And him just staring down the barrel, not, you know, like keeping a bead on you is like so great and so perfect. And it was really important that we get that done. So you can see that like the arm and the wrist and stuff are using an IK solver and his head is turning and moving, but he's still playing the animation on the rest of uh, the character. So let's talk about speaking. So if there's one thing Rick and Morty do a lot of in the show, it's talking. <laughs> and uh, speaking is a unique challenge because there's a lot of animation involved and getting lip sync right is really important for you to feel like the character is actually in the game. So uh, we, what you see on the left there is the actual character sheet from the, from the television show that they use to, uh, to create their you know, speaking animations. And then on the right is our 3D approximation of that, you know, of that sheet. And so what we ended up doing was actually using, we needed to get kind of halfway there or most of the way there if we could, because having the animators go in and try to hand animate every single animation to, uh, to match the faces, even if they were just tweening between these individual poses, is still incredibly time consuming. So we actually used the Oculus real-time lip sync plugin. And uh, what we did with that is the Unity, pl the Unity plugin, we wrote a Unity plugin that, sam that samples that Oculus plugin in real time as it plays. So basically we play the audio file through the character's face and then we begin sampling at a consistent frame rate that character's face. We then turn those samples into uh, keyframes in a Unity animation. We then had a script that generated a Mel script to then convert those animations uh, from the Unity animation set where it had those keyframe poses into the controls and dials that you see. And so what is going on in these two pictures is the one on the left is uh, let's see, yeah, the one on the left, you can see the teeth kind of fall below the, um, kind of fall below the head. That's one that's imported directly. So then our artist had to go in and clean it up. And the one on the right is the same exact line cleaned up. But what you can see is even the one, the, the picture on the left, you see these controls moving up and down. And that got us really, really far along in the process. And it allowed us to, um, to, it allowed us to iterate very quickly on VO without having to redo it. The other nice thing about having that plugin is if we didn't have data for this animation, we automatically just kicked into using the Oculus real time. So when we were recording custom VO and, and just like general 
you know, temp VO, we would still have lip synced characters, which is incredibly important because if your character's standing there and talking through closed lips and you're in VR, you hit that uncanny valley immediately and go like, nope, they're not real. And so this, this was an important part about making these characters feel real. This is a tiny screenshot of our character controller. Joel, who's in the audience, did most of the character controller. Uh, it's half state machine, half code, as you can see by just a bunch of floating states out there. Um, it is complicated, and there's no real way around this. I guess the whole thing is we have, this, we have serious FOMO for timeline, because we were doing this pre-timeline, and uh, once we saw that, we were like, man, this character controller could have been a lot simpler had we just had timeline from the beginning. But we were syncing a lot of animations all at once, and sometimes they had to key into each other, and sometimes they just had to be able to play. And uh, so, you know, I, I don't really have good tips on character controllers other than uh, best of luck to all of us. Quantized animation. So this is another, uh, this is another kind of interesting problem we ran into. Uh, basically, in these characters, um, Unity's tweening system tries to smooth curves out. But there were certain times that our animators had decided that they wanted a very specific animation to play. So we would do with what we called quantizing the animation. We would literally generate 90 keyframes a second to make sure that the animation was perfectly synced with the actual playing of the game. And what that meant is that, uh, well one, there are a lot of keyframes they made for big files. So we had to kind of pick and choose the places, but we used an asset preprocessor again to uh, where certain parts, and again, this is metadata, we would mark out certain parts of the file and say like, okay, right from here to here, we need exactly 90 frames a second. And you can actually see the big difference here with <clears throat> the 100% crazy mouth being like that perfectly triangular, awesome burp, and the more than 50% garbage tweens being a spot where, you know, Rick's mouth is kind of floppy and it doesn't look so great. So throughout the game, there's a number of places where we, in fact, like went in and, uh, and you know, put this level of quantization in. Player interaction was like a really important thing that we, that we really wanted to have uh, in the game. So you can see this. So we, we use a system called Puppet Master. It's on the asset store. Um, it's an animation and physics pinning system. So to kind of describe that in a little bit of detail, basically it's a solver where you have a rag doll and a, um, you have a ragdoll and your animation, and the solver's attempting to kind of find a happy middle ground between both of them, and there's a lot of settings. So it was incredibly difficult to customize, uh, and we went through, we had a lot of uh, work just to get that to work, but it was really worth it. You can see that like, the last thing you want is, it used to be that, and, and they mentioned this in the other talk, that you put your hand out and you'd, uh, it just passed through the player. So we, didn't, we did do some experimentation with actually detecting a hand entering certain areas of characters, but we just, this came into the project very late and it was, um, it was pretty unfortunate that uh, we didn't have more time to kind of tinker around with this. But uh, I think that this is a great growth area for people uh, who, are, who are starting to embark on this like insanity of putting realized characters in there to, to kind of explore this more. And uh, Puppet Master and Final IK were the, were the two things that went into this. So I don't have time to go through every single thing, and I think I might even be able to pull up a bunch of questions, but uh, I wanted to talk about like an example issue we face. So, so one of the things that, that happened frequently that, uh, you know, you always go through these talks and it just looks like we were amazing the whole time and like, yeah, we built these tools and they work perfectly and we never threw anything out. Uh, but we actually did run into a ton of issues. So I kind of want to run down one just to show you what the process of that was like. So what you see in that picture there on the right is what Rick looked like in Maya. And on the left is what Rick looked like in the game. And that's not good. Uh, so basically, you know, we, we had to go through this process. And, and what you're seeing here is the result of like multiple iterations over multiple weeks of attempting to fix this. And it finally turns out that the, the Maya skin tool does not respect the max bones number. Basically, there's two steps in the pipeline of, of uh, using the skin tool where everything gets kind of baked down and then you're stuck. 
uh, where it just like assumes whatever it wants to. And so this caused too many bone influences per vert, which, is, which was really important because like, that meant that some of the bones that were not supposed to be influencing the coat were influencing the coat and thus pulling the jacket inside Rick. So our final solution is that for this was that we used the NG Skin Tools uh, plugin for Maya to paint proper skin weights and preserve the bone limit per vert. And that tool actually really allowed us to uh, solve this issue and that's why Rick's jacket doesn't intersect. And we got an added bonus that it lets you mirror skin weights. So if you're making a character and you have the skin weights on the right arm and the identical arms, you can just flip them over and mirror them. And so that works really well. So yeah, this, was, this is a, a great example. There were many other issues. We had you know, times where character animations wouldn't sync up. Syncing the animation to the play data was incredibly difficult. There's a scene where a car comes in and uh, hits Rick and uh, Rick and Rick flies away and the timing of that while not using the timeline plugin uh, was was like milliseconds level of you know us going in an editor and typing zero 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 one two so it's like these are all crazy animation things you see hopefully you know we as Unity's tools are getting, uh, you know, we're getting new tools in this area. We have to do less of that, but it's, you know, these are all the different things that we all run into. So when you put it all together, this is what it looks like. You see Rick and Morty talking. They're looking at you. You saw Rick pointing at Morty and looking at him, and then turning and looking back at you. And now they're waiting for you to do something, and you're not doing it. So, but then they're turning back, and now they're talking and posing. So this is kind of the when the whole system comes together, this is you know, what it looks like and it really flows well and we think that we really hit something where people felt like they were in the game. We, we've only heard, uh, you know, the, the, the best compliment we get is it was like, it's like another episode of the show and I think that the characters were a really key part of that. So with that, I saved some time for questions uh, because I'm sure that people have some questions. Thank you. So there's some microphones in the middle, so if people just want to line up. Or did I so thoroughly cover characters that no one, everyone's ready to just make it happen? Uh, was there any influence from uh, accounting in this game? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, there, there isn't a, I, to not get too deep into it, there is a like direct accounting reference in the game. We, we, do crack a, we do crack an accounting joke at the end of the game. Uh, but, and we had played accounting, but there, I think there's a little, you know, you can't make a Justin Roiland game without some of that, like, uh, soul being poured into it. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? All right, well, if there's no more questions, thank you very much.